Uh, welcome everyone who's watching us today. We are extremely excited about today's webinar and very grateful to be uh, joined by Winona LaDuc, who uh, we will introduce in just a moment. Uh, as we get started, uh, we always open with our, with our land acknowledgement that the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center here on our campus, uh, where we live and reside, acknowledge the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands we sit and upon which we work and reside. Uh, even, even beyond that particular land acknowledgement, uh, everyone at Crow Canyon understands that our mission is not even possible without indigenous people in the past, present, and future. And we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. And we are sincerely grateful to all indigenous people and support the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands which is absolutely critical uh, to our mission, which is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. This month in particular is American Indian Heritage Month uh, and uh, uh, Becky and Taylor and, and the other folks that you'll be seeing today have worked um, hard to, to put some incredible uh, scholars in, in front of us for these, for these webinars. Um, including today. So just a couple Zoom hints. You'll be seeing some video and some presentations. Uh, our, my talking head at the moment, there will be other talking heads, will be along the right side of your screen. Uh, and if you want to move them over, you just uh, move your cursor over near uh, the heads and you can move them over or make them smaller so that the, the PowerPoint is um, more prominent if that's what you wish. Uh, there is a live transcription uh, option here for the hearing impaired, um, and that should become obvious on your screen, but if it's not, go ahead and put it in the, in the chat and Taylor will help you out with that. Uh, when you have questions that occur to you during the presentation, uh, please use the Q&A portion to enter your questions instead of the chat. Sometimes questions can get buried in the chat. And if you have a little trouble with the Zoom and you're on Facebook, you can just head over to our live stream and you will see us on Facebook as well. And uh, all of our webinars or most of our webinars are available on YouTube after the presentation. Just a, a, a quick update on what's coming up. We actually have two webinars uh, next week that we're also ex incredibly excited about. And you'll see Becky and I moderating on, on there as well. Uh, Art and Activism with Ricardo Cate on Tuesday, which is not a normal webinar day for us. So keep that in mind if you'd like to join. And then at our usual Thursday webinar time, uh, we have Dr. Alex Jones with Archaeology Education as Redress, highlighting archaeology in the community's education programs. And we often get questions about uh, where our viewers can go to support uh, indigenous communities that we work with at Crow Canyon and uh, who are ancestral to uh, the sites that we work on. And you can see some of these um, organizations here with our friends and partners. Uh, you can go ahead and just take a picture of these um, or let us know and we will make sure that you have, uh, have the information you need if you'd like to support some of these communities. Uh, with that, I'd like to first introduce um, Rebecca Hammond, who's also a moderator here today. Rebecca is um, a very dear friend and colleague of mine uh, and uh, has been with Crow Canyon for 23 years. She is a Ute tribal member and is um, our, currently our uh, American Indian Outreach Manager and has, has worked uh, very hard in these webinars to line them up uh, for American Indian Heritage Month. So um, Becky, can I uh, hand it over to you? And you're up oh, there you okay. go, Becky. Good evening. Um, it's wonderful to be able to uh, introduce Bonona. Um, you know, Winona is just an amazing and has done so much for indigenous communities in the United States and of the world. And so um, I'm just going to read her bio for you and we'll go from there. Winona LaDuc is a hard educated economist, environmental activist, author, hemp farmer, grandmother, and a two time former Green Party vice president candidate with Ralph Nader. LaDuke specializes in rural development, economic food and energy sovereignty, environmental justice, 
living and working on White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota. She leads several organizations, including Honor the Earth, co-founded with the Indigo, Indigo Girls 28 years ago, and Anishinaabe Agricultural Institute, Aking, and Winona's Camp. These organizations develop and model cultural-based sustainable development strategies utilizing renewable energy and sustainable food systems. She is also an international thought leader, lecturer in climate change, renewable energy and environmental justice, plus an advocate for protecting indigenous plants, heritage foods from, from patenting and genetic engineering. At, at the age of 18, testified at the United Nations in Geneva against nuclear testing and uranium mining on the Navajo Reservation. Winona's written several books. The, last, the latest book that she has done, To Be a Water Protector, The Rise of, Windy, the, the, Rise of the Windigo Slayers. There are those who credit her with the growing strong and vocal collaborations between worldwide, worldwide indigenous nations in an effort to repair, honor, and sustain Mother Earth. That's it. So thank you for being here, Winona. Oh, thank you. Okay. Ninga and Shichike. Ninga and Shichike. Nipe. Munche. This is the same water that was here when dinosaurs were here. There is no new water. This is the only water we will ever know. This is the same water that my great ancestors drank from and harvested our wild rice upon.
are a story fed by generations. You carry songs of grief, triumph, thankfulness, and joy. Feel their power as they ascend within you. As you walk, run swiftly, even fly into infinite possibility. Let go that which burdens you. Let go any acts of unkindness or brutality. Let go that which has burdened your family, your community, your nation, or disturbed your soul. Let go one breath into another. Pray thankfulness for this earth we are, for this becoming we are, for this sunlight touching skin we are, for the cooling waters we are. Listen now as earth sheds her skin. Listen as the generations move one against the other to make power. We are bringing in a new story. We will be accompanied by ancient and new songs and we'll celebrate together. <laughs> Kisake iku, kimi kwetche wene miku, kisha wene miku. Miigwech, um, thank you for seeing our film. I don't know if y'all can hear me yet. Um, we can hear you. Good, okay. Um, listen, that's my life for the past year. I've spent uh, seven years of my life, eight years of my life fighting Enbridge, the single largest uh, pipeline company in the world that just put a pipe through Northern Minnesota, despite all of our efforts. And um, so I'm, you know, I'm here to talk about what it is to be in this moment and what it is to be in a just transition. But thank you for your time. And I wanna send a special uh, greeting out to my friends, Mary Ackman and James Reitz, Cowboy and the Missus for inviting me. And thank you all for the honor of being here with you today. So let me just talk a little bit about where we're at and what we're thinking. So ani nindawe maganaduk, that means hello, my relatives. Benesi kwe njinikaz makwando deyam gababani ka dish kaniganing in dunjaba telling you the place I am from, kind of like Crow Canyon, a place that you are from, a place that you owe your heart to. You know, so this is where I live and the, where the wild things are. I guess it is not so different than you, but up where the land is with the lakes and the wild rice. And I'm, I'm honored to be here with you today. I have a, a little slide, some slides to show that talk about our story here, and I'm going to put them up in a hopefully a successful manner. Can you see that? Yep, we can see it. Perfect. And then she put it on the next thing. It went like that. Ta -da! Okay. So this is some art from my area. Um, this is in downtown Duluth. And I like to show this piece by an artist named Botan because uh, there's a lot of missing and murdered indigenous women, but this one is a water protector and she's indigenous and she's not missing and murdered. And she's like 40 feet tall and 20 feet wide and not going anywhere. <laughs> this is the story of when people start to take back their power which is the story of us in Northern Minnesota. This is a time of prophecies. That is what it is, a time of prophecies. We are told in this time that we would have a choice. It's called the time of the seventh fire in our prophecies. We are told that we would have a choice between two paths. One would be well-worn and scorched and the other would be green. Well-worn and scorched and the other green would be our choice upon which path to embark. And I'm pretty sure that's not just our story. I think that's the story of this country. Which path are we gonna go down? So let me talk, talk to you about the path that I know. This is art from my territory. And I like to show this art because when I was an undergraduate at Harvard University, if you wanted to see the art from Europe, you went to the fine arts department. But if you wanted to see indigenous art, you had to go to anthropology. So that is just to say that it's pretty clear that there's a value assessment with indigenous people, which puts us pretty low <laughs> on the not fine department. But what I'm gonna humbly suggest to you is that the problems that we face today did not come from indigenous people. They came from a different worldview, a different paradigm. And it is possible that the solutions to the problems that we face today will not be found in the paradigm that created them. So I wanna ask y'all to think outside your box and let us work together. A little bit about indigenous people. 
you know, so I live in the northern boreal forest and uh, indigenous people are about 4% of the world's population, but we represent about 75% of the world's biodiversity. We're the people who live in the Amazon rainforest, the people who live in the boreal forest, uh, we're the people of the Pacific, um, where the wild things are, that's where indigenous people live. And so as we talk about how we're gonna protect our mother earth, you gotta start with where the wild things are. You cannot recreate a forest with a tree plantation. That is not the same thing. You need to protect the forests and you need to protect the water. You need to protect where the wild things are, which means you really need to work with indigenous people because we're the people that know the songs and the ceremonies and have lived there for 10,000 years in the same place. You know, this is a little bit about some of the reservations and I know that you're all pretty knowledgeable about this, but my reservation is that square box up in Northern Minnesota. And, uh, this is uh, federal lands, and I was just really glad to hear about the uh, Biden administration and Bears Ears, which I'm sure that you were all very happy to hear about. But indigenous lands, this is what represents our reservations, but obviously our treaty territories and, and our sacred sites are much larger territory. This is where I live, Gawawi Yegama, Ground Lake, the middle of the White Earth Reservation. And um, this is a little bit about what it is to be great, <laughs> as to say, this is like, make America great, make America great. My thinking is America was great when there were 10,000 varieties of corn. Tremendous agrobiodiversity. You know, I'd heard that you have some traditional gardens down there at Tr Crow Canyon. And you know, the, the, the key I believe to our solutions are the knowledge of these traditional plants, which are pre-petroleum and post-petroleum. 10,000 varieties of corn, those did not get created by Monsanto or DuPont or Syngenta. They were created by people who looked like me, who gathered those seeds and saved them and created all those corn varieties. And America was great when there were 50 million buffalo, single largest migratory herd in the world. And those buffalo uh, made prairies and lived on 250 different species of grass. That's when America was greatest, when we had biodiversity. And in that same territory where there were once 50 million buffalo, there are today about 28 million cattle. And a lot of those guys are in CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations, which are not good for life in any way. And so I'm just kind of wondering about the wisdom of the American agriculture system. Uh, you know, buffalo are no animals that know how to survive during the extreme weather, when a cow requires a lot of fossil fuels to keep it around. So Again, indigenous knowledge, indigenous species, those are, those are, things, those are part of the, the life of this land. And this is uh, my territory. This is Don Goodwin and myself out here looking at wild rice. That's what that is, monomen or wild rice, our most sacred food. And it only grows in my territory, in the heart of wild rice territory. Uh, where there are Anishinaabe, there is wild rice. And uh, it's the only green indigenous to North America. And uh, this is what we are fighting to protect, our wild rice. And this lake, Lower Rice Lake, had really low water levels this year and it was impossible to harvest the rice because there was so little rain because of the extreme drought brought by climate change and then the water that was stolen by Enbridge. This is kind of a historic conflict photo, that's what I would call this, between Sitting Bull and Custer two significant characters in American history and really representing two different worldviews. And um, I think that that is the same conflict that we have today. So this is what the scorch path looks like. This could be anywhere, pick a state. <laughs> we will just say that this is in Alberta. This photo was actually taken in Fort McMurray, Alberta, in uh, the heart of the tar sands area when they had horrible fires there a few years ago. But this summer, the sky was red with fires from Canada. And that is what these times are. These are times when we live in disasters of biblical proportions. That's what we got, disasters of biblical proportions. And we don't have a, a frame for this, whether it is that, you know, a framework for how to solve this, because whether it's the fires to the west or the melting ice caps to the north or the political disasters to the east or the hurricanes and, and uh, oil spills to the south, you know, these are times that are unprecedented in our, in our history. And it is also time of a pandemic, you know? So you have a multiple set of crises. You have the crises of climate change, and then you have the pandemic in which we all live. And now we zoom around the world, including myself. And in saying that, you know, uh, forces are, sh are shifting all around us. You know, this past year during the pandemic 
we saw the George Floyd trial in Minnesota. And, and you know, over the past two years, we've seen the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, and we saw uh, changes happen. I mean, I, I heard that the Onyate statue is down outside of Santa Fe. You go, take that guy down. And never in my life did I think that there would be 40 statues of Columbus toppled and a bunch of conquistadors and some Confederate soldiers. Social movement surging, political and economic changes and crises. We could all agree with that. And then uh, a pandemic, uh, now would be the time to change. I like what Erin Dotty Roy says, that Indian writer, when she talks about pandemic as portal. She says, in the history of the world, pandemics have always forced societies to change, and this one is no different. It's a, uh, it's a doorway between one world and the next. And um, she asks the question is, you want to walk through the doorway? What do you want to take through the portal? She says the portal. She says, uh, you know, pandemics has forced us to change, and, and what are you going to take? She says, are you going to take your avarice, your hatred, your data banks, and your dirty rivers? Are you going to walk through clean? That's what I think. I think this is an opportunity to transform, and I think we should take it. And, you know, if we don't, we could just keep paying for our billion dollar climate change disasters because those are just gonna increase in no county or tribe or anybody has a budget for the future. So no time like the present to move along. Um, from my point of view, this is why we spent uh, all this time fighting line three coming into Minnesota. Some people don't have the memo on the time to change. The fossil fuel industry is still hanging on. And why I say that is that um, hanging on would mean, I mean, why are we exporting oil in this country? You know, why do we end up being an oil exporting country when we have had all this crisis about not having enough oil? And then we're importing all this oil from Canada, and that's the dirtiest oil in the world. Tar sands, dirtiest oil in the world, and kind of like moving peanut butter and huge amount of energy and a huge amount of pollution, and everybody's divesting. You know, my our alma mater, Harvard, divested a couple of weeks ago. I was like, oh, Harvard, you never divested. They wouldn't divest from South Africa when I was a student. I mean, and, uh, the Saudi Sovereign Fund, I think the EU pension funds, everybody is divesting from the tar sands. In fact, the largest mine, the tech mine didn't happen because uh, of divestment and because of a lack of capitalization. And so you have the dying industry that's hanging on, trying to suck the last bit of lifeblood. And the battles of Minnesota are not just our battles, they're really national battles because Ambridge moves 75% of the tar sands into this country. So if you want to move somebody along, you might move them along. And you already saw some of these pictures, but this is my life. <laughs> this is my life with Enbridge. Um, I am all ready for the just transition. I don't know about you all, but I'm ready to sign up and roll up my sleeves and make the next economy. Frankly, this last economy didn't do too well for indigenous people. I think the next economy should, we should not be in the situation we're in with it. We'd be, where we've been made paupers, paupers in our own land, paupers. So uh, I call this the sitting bull plan. You could call it a lot of things, but I call it the sitting bull plan because why? Because he was a great political leader. And what sitting bull said is, let us put our minds together to see what kind of future we can make for our children. Let us put our minds together to see what kind of future we can make for our children. And that to me is really what we need to do. This is not about who is the smartest or what what company is gonna save us? Is Tesla gonna save us? Is Amazon gonna save us? No, they're gonna take their money and go to the moon from what I can see. You know, what you need to do is uh, figure out how we're gonna save us. And that's how we put our minds together. So I'm gonna tell you a story about our community. This is where I live. Uh, I think that uh, these were referred to by James as the lost boys. I live with a whole bunch of boys. I parent some of them. I am a grandparent. These are great. I got a couple of grandchildren there, but the rest of them that are in this picture are boys who came to live with us because we have the horses and we are now running pretty much a farm school program. That's what I would say we're running. And uh, during the pandemic, they all moved in and uh, it's been great. And uh, schools are still closed down, half of them up here. So I'm like, I don't know, we're hanging in. But what we've been doing is farming. And uh, this is the women's team farming. We are practicing and interested in post-petroleum and reduced petroleum agriculture. And so here you see some of our hardworking women um, that are working in our beautiful field that is a field that has been devastated by industrial agriculture, but we are putting all kinds of fish guts and all kinds of uh, 
manure on this field and bringing life into it. And uh, then we are planting with horses. This is Kara. She's a horsewoman and uh, she's got a couple of ponies and uh, corn cedar. And there we go. She's off to uh, plant a field and we had really successful crops this year from uh, Kara's excellent work with the horses. Now, let's talk about this because what it's what you grow is also matters. So these are potatoes. I grow 17 varieties of potatoes with my partner, Don Wadle. He's the big potato man, but I'm actually the bigger potato woman this year. And uh, I specialize in purple potatoes, which were grown by my ancestors and for thousands of years. But um, these are some cool looking potatoes. And, and you know what's interesting is, is that the uh, climate change science guys are here studying uh, these potatoes in particular at the Potato Museum in Cusco. Um, that's where these are from. And uh, the thing is, is that potato, that same climate change adaptation in potatoes, because some plants are better in different situations. And so there's tremendous biodiversity. This is what I know is that if you, if you, uh, you know, the Irish potato family should have taught us this is, uh, you know, let me know how a single variety is going to work out for you. This year, my, uh, some of my potatoes suffered from blight and the others did not. Um, you know, and what I know is that in the driest year, my potatoes were still good without irrigation. And I also grow this squash. This is called uh, Gete Okosaman. And uh, this squash kind of like squash is really, um, the thing is, is that most of the varieties we grow are much higher in antioxidants and amino acids and, and all kinds of minerals and vitamins than conventional varieties, like twice the protein and half the calories across the board. Now, why is that? So my theory is, is that, uh, you know, we all grew cool vegetables, we had our heritage varieties, but in the industrialization of the food system, they wanted food that could travel well, 1400 miles or so, arrive all at the same time, pack well, and uh, somehow they lost the nutritional value out of it. And they also added a lot of fossil fuels to it in the meantime, but these guys are pre-petroleum and post-petroleum. So I got these first squash seeds about 13, 14 years ago, and I um, grew the squash out, and I was told when I was given the seeds to it that, they, that the seeds had come from an archeological dig. You guys don't like this down there, Crow Canyon? An archeological dig where a clay ball was found, and inside of that clay ball was these seeds, and these seeds uh, grew this squash. And um, they carbon dated it like 800 years old. So, I was like, that's the most amazing story I ever heard. And I started growing the squash and I was super nervous, but it grew well. And then uh, I started talking about the squash and people are like, what's the story of the squash and what's its name? And so then this one guy, a scholar who lived works with us sometimes, he was like, oh, you're wrong with the story, Winona. The story is really, it's a Miami squash and it's a thousand years old. I said, okay, it is good. You know, I'm glad you tracked that down. But my point here is, is that this squash is an old squash. And so I was asked about when it was named and I was asked a few times and I said, uh, you know, I'm gonna call this squash, I'm gonna name this squash. And I decided to name it because white guys name stuff all the time. So I'm gonna name this squash. And I named this squash Gete Okosamen, which means something like really cool old squash in Ojibwe. That's what I did, I named it. And uh, so I, know that this is, has arrived because the squash is now be featured in the Baker C catalog as Geteo Kosman with that story. But the thing about a squash is that it's really about possibility because inside that squash, one time I had some students measure, measure but they had 1600 seeds. And what does that tell you? That tells you that that's an optimistic plant and it is really expecting that it's gonna have a bunch of children. And it also keeps really well, a squash does. It doesn't need to be frozen or, or processed, it keeps. And so that is why I love the squash because the squash really exemplifies the possibilities of um, low carbon food systems and nutritional food. And in the time of the pandemic, more people than ever came about, they had about a 40% increase in home gardening because we couldn't go anywhere and our food systems had collapsed. Um, meaning that they plowed in a bunch of beans and peas and spilled a bunch of milk and crushed a bunch of eggs because, you know, the thing is, is that big is not always best. Size matters and you don't want a big food system. What you want is a local food system because you have a much better chance in a time of, of climate change 
to have more local foods. So grow some food and then don't waste so much. So let's say that the average meal travels 1400 miles from farmer to table. That works well unless you've got a problem with your food system. Let's say a shrimp travels uh, from deveined in Scotland, no, raised in Scotland, deveined in China and sold at a Walmart near you. That's a long ways for a shrimp to travel. It's kind of like the Fiji water. How far should water travel? So uh, we need to not waste food and we need to relocalize our food system in a time of climate change. And you need to grow cool food, in my assessment. And then you need to grow hemp. Now, not everybody's going to grow hemp, but hemp is uh, what I'm interested in. And I'm interested in fiber hemp. I've been growing for seven years. I have a state of Minnesota permit and a federal hemp permit. And my work is in rebuilding the hemp fiber economy. So this here is hemp. And this is hemp in my field. I got a son in there and a partner. And I got two sons, a partner, a nephew, and, a, and a, a, someone I work with. Uh, Ronnie, and this is what our hemp looks like, which looks a lot like bamboo or something. Um, can't get high on my crop. You know, you could smoke the whole field and you still wouldn't be high, you'd have a headache. But uh, this is what you make the fiber economy out of or make the materials economy out of. And that's why hemp is so significant. This is um, what you can do with it. Hemp versus trees, you know, so it's soup, it bioaccumulates. You, Breathes four times more carbon dioxide. It's a carbon sink. Stronger, more durable. You can make paper out of it. You can make a new economy out of this. Um, and in terms of fabric, that's what I'm interested in. The word canvas comes from cannabis. The word canvas comes from cannabis. I had no idea about that until I started growing hemp. And look at this. We're all cool because we're wearing cotton. Well, cotton uses a quarter of the world's pesticides and is 4% of the world's crops. So why don't you do something like hemp and uh, rebuild a hemp economy now? It's been illegal in this country since the passage of the Marijuana Prohibition Act, but it is now legal. But literally they burned the book on it. So we're trying to figure out how to make it again. And uh, what's significant about it is that Minnesota used to have 11 hemp mills. Did y'all hear me? Minnesota had 11 hemp mills. And so what if I just want it back? Now this here, you see this here? This is my hemp. This is my hemp fiber. And uh, the thing is, is that this is about 25% or 30% of the plant is this fiber. But uh, the other, the, the rest of the hemp that is not this fiber is uh, what you're gonna use for making hempcrete. Hmm or now I'm working on insulation because uh, that's pretty amazing uh, as an opportunity for the North country to also do insulation. So uh, and that is 70% of the plant is in the vast, or is in, is in the herd, which is in the middle of the plant as opposed to the vast fiber. So I refer to hemp as the new green revolution. Uh, because it can replace everything in fossil fuels and it can certainly replace a lot of concrete, which if concrete was a country, it'd be like the third largest source of CO2 emissions in the world, concrete. So what if we just move it along? This is what I call the new green revolution. This is my 60s photo, which was taken a couple of years ago in my hemp field, but hemp is the new green revolution and that's what we're doing. And I think that's what we can call it fairly because Minnesota was the home of Norman Borlaug at the University of Minnesota. And Norman Borlaug at the University of Minnesota created what was called the Green Revolution, which brought us all of the GMOs and industrialized and, and uh, fossil fuel agriculture. He came out of Minnesota. So I feel like the new Green Revolution should come out of Minnesota and that's gonna be hemp and it's gonna come from North. And then I wanna talk a little bit about energy systems. So here on White Earth, we build solar thermal panels. This is us putting many years ago, a solar thermal panel up on the south side wall of a house in my housing project. And it can save about 20% of your heating bill. Y'all could do it down there too, because Minnesota, cold as heck, but sunny as heck in the winter, just cold as heck. And so turns out that, I think a lot of you probably know this, but solar energy is more effective 
during the cold. I don't really understand what it is, but something about the cold, it's like more direct and, it, and it's more efficient. And this is our manufacturing facility and uh, doesn't even have my full crowd in it, but this is where we make um, solar thermal panels and we sell them regionally and nationally. And uh, eight fire solar. And we do this right here on the reservation. And uh, our opportunity is really a lot of other folks' opportunities of solar, solar thermal efficiency. You know, we waste a lot of energy though. So that's foundationally like, why would you try to build a renewable energy system when we're wasting about 60% of the energy today between point of origin and point of consumption? You'd wanna get efficient and you would wanna get local. And you wanna you want get this, this is an electric train. Now, why is this so interesting? It's called Solutionary Rail. I've been working with these guys for a few years. Just a, just a revolutionary idea. Their idea is to run the trains on direct power of renewables. Now, why are we talking about this? Because they're talking about an infrastructure plan, but jeepers, the infrastructure of this country would be far more efficient if it was on rail. Now, why do I say that? Oh, because if you think about it, first of all, a it's a choice between rubber on the road or metal on metal. A train is about 50% more efficient than other kind of transport. Then add to the question of electric versus combustion. Now it turns out that a combustion engine is, let me just say this to use real slow. A combustion engine is 16% efficient. <laughs> and a electric engine is 60% efficient. So 16 versus 60. So what kind of society considers, continues on with a 16% efficient engine system when you could be 60% efficient? I'm going for 60. So you want electric trains and uh, you could go everywhere on them. And a lot of them can go right through Indian territory because we they were built through our territories. Um, and we have a lot of renewable energy, particularly in the West and in the, in the uh, Northern Plains area that could power a lot of these rails. Now, of course, the United States, so far behind. Percentage of electric railways worldwide. Like, why couldn't we beat Italy? Or Russia? Or India? No, we're the United States. So what am I saying? Grow up, grow up America. Get your act together, get some efficiency and quit moving stuff that you don't need. That's the solution. The just transition is not going to be built on the same inefficient economy. It makes no sense whatsoever. It's going to be local. This is a solar project up on the in uh, in uh, northern northern Alberta and a Lubicon Cree community. Now this woman's name is Melina Lubicon, and she's from this village. And her village is in the middle of the tar sands, but her health clinic is run by a diesel generator. Did y'all hear me say that? She's in the middle of tar sands, but they don't have electricity for their health clinic. That's what colonialism looks like uh, in Canada, one model of it. But anyway, for her master's thesis at the University of Victoria, her master's thesis, she built 20 kilowatts of solar to keep her village electric system going. That's what leadership looks like. That's what leadership looks like. And uh, this is solar project at Navajo, the Cayenta solar project, 26 megawatts. I believe this project is. And this is my village, uh, putting up some solar panels and that's my cousin Terry's artwork mural on the side of a house. Um, we've done a lot of work to try to make our little housing project better. And it's still a housing project, but it's beautiful. I was inspired by Bami Ali, I think it's in the mission. I was inspired by the mission. So the just transition, the next economy, the sitting bull plan, the eighth fire, that's what we call it. You wanna relocalize. What is this here? This is wind turbines coming into the port of Duluth, all from Europe. Why is this a problem? Because if you had that much energy to produce and that much potential, why would you import it all from overseas? This, uh, yeah, this wind turbines are coming in. Duluth is the most inland port. And then they are going out to Nebraska. 
So I would like to see us rebuild manufacturing in this country and make things that we need here. That's what I think. I think we could rebuild the textile economy. My grandmother was a garment worker and was a union garment worker. I think we could build a textile economy with dignity and I think we could rebuild a manufacturing economy that made sense. Not just be people who buy stuff. People who buy stuff that we make here would be better. Um, I wanna say pray hard. There's a lot of evil out there in the world, but in the midst of that, you know, believe in your water. I'm a water protector. And this is some, um, a document put together by um, Dr. Emoto out of, of Japan. And he studied all of the water uh, crystals and he documented them. And what you can see here is, I didn't know that crystals all have different identities, but that's what he found. And he found that uh, polluted water doesn't look happy and clean water looks better. But he also found that praying with your water, it can look better too. So keep your faith, keep your prayers. And uh, let's make some laws that make sense. This is uh, Evo Morales, the former president of Bolivia until Elon Musk had a successful lithium coup. We will call it that, but Evo is back first indigenous president of a country. And in that, one of the first laws that he passed was the rights of mother earth. And he, he put that into the Bolivian constitution, the rights of mother earth. And for our tribe, the white earth and Anishinaabe, we have ingrained the rights of Manoma or wild rice in our constitution, in, in our tribal regulatory authority. And as such, uh, Manoma or wild rice filed suit against the state of Minnesota for the mismanagement of all of the water of our people and uh, the Enbridge contracts. And Wild Rice sued the state of Minnesota and that was referred to federal court. This is my future generation, my retirement plan. I don't know about y'all, but my 401k probably is not gonna be worth very much. <laughs> but what I'm gonna do is invest in a generation of young women and men to make a better future. That's my retirement plan right there. And uh, here's my organization, Onto the Earth. You know, happy to uh, share this story with you. And I'm also um, just happy to be with you today and happy to answer some questions as you like. Miigwech. Thank you so much, Winona, for the incredible presentation. I think we're all taking it in. Uh, we have a couple of questions, but um, that we'll ask, but sort of selfishly, uh, I think us at Crow Canyon would, would want to ask you um, in particular, which I'm sure you get a lot, what, what can um, like-minded nonprofits, uh, people, um, communities uh, do that would be actionable to uh, help further this and further the, the, the green revolution and, and a just transition? Well, first, you know, one of the reasons I like talking to folks like you is you're like me, you're place-based, you know, stick to a place, protect it, you know, envision what the future is to look like, you know, because the fact is, is that change is inevitable. It's a question of who controls the change, you know, and we get in a situation where we let others put, you know, if you, if you're waiting for someone from Washington, D.C. to come up with a brilliant idea, that's not going to happen, you know. So have the vision of how we're going to take care of our mother earth and work together and, and let us make that work, you know? And so in that process, you got to like fight off bad guys often, you know, I spent a whole life fighting off bad guys. And every day I'm amazed at the latest bad ideas that can appear. I was like, how did you come up with that bad idea? Oh, that's such a bad idea. And so we fight them. And, you know, I mean, the Enbridge success in line three is not us. They didn't get a win for any of us. You don't get a tiara for putting in a $9 billion pipeline. No one gets a tiara for putting in a $9 billion pipeline at the end of the fossil fuels era and climate change. That's crazy stuff. But I know a lot of people that, and a lot of times I've seen a lot of projects just die because people fought them, you know, because they're super capital intensive. So fight the bad guys off and make something more beautiful, you know, and we got to save something for the, you know, we gotta save the wild places. That's what we gotta do, you know. And that's I know what you're. I know that that's a lot of the work that you all are doing. Fantastic. How, what what should we tell the people who who we interact with uh, uh, 
um, on an individual level, uh, kind of the same same sense of uh, fighting the bad guys and and working uh, locally, or or any other I mean, thoughts or recommendations. Yeah, I mean, I think that's it. I mean, let us put our minds together to see what kind of future you can make for our children. I mean, I really think that that is also. Uh, oh, what would I say? You know, I would I would say that it's uh, everybody has some gifts. You know, I mean, sometimes it takes a while what to figure out their gifts. You know, and you know, but today, uh, today I went and planted a bunch of Jerusalem artichokes because they're perennial. Oh, you'll like this. Jim and Mary will like this. So the Enbridge Corporation, who you have heard that I don't like, they bought the land on two sides of my organization, blocking us off. They bought 160 acres around us. I was like, no, 100 and, and 120 acres. I was like, what are you doing? Why'd you buy the land around us? You know, they were conducting surveillance, making sure we didn't like you know, I have a lot of water protectors there. And, you know, and then they were like, well, we would like to be your friends. I was like, you're not my friend, you're a predator. So we're buying the land back. I just got the money in hand today to buy the land back from them. And you know what I did today? Planted Jerusalem artichokes all over a section of that land. Let's have a perennial crop. I'm gonna plant some hemp there too. No pipelines, give me some hemp and Jerusalem artichokes, you know? Do something cool to make everything better. I say, just stick to that one too, that'd be great. You know, I love that. I know that that our our staff and partners will love the do something cool to make things better, and and we uh, are happy that we have some platforms like our Pueblo Farming Project, and, and a lot of our folks uh, we do have have some land here with some experimental far, uh, gardens on it, and I, I think as we decide what where to put our priorities going forward. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we I mean, you guys can, you guys can grow things differently than I, but you know, what's your growing season there? I mean. You know, I got like a June till end of September. This year I had a very generous fall. I mean, I just had a few frosts in October, right? Is that about your season too? Yeah, I mean, it's short, right? Uh, we're up here on the on the Colorado Plateau and that's that's part of some of the, the research and experimental work that we're doing is uh, how did uh, ancestral Pueblo communities uh, work with the short growing season uh, that we have here, um, some variable numbers of frost-free days. And, and uh, so that's that's actually one of the one of the research questions that we're working on. And then some of the experimental gardening has to do with uh, trying it out uh, as well. Right, I mean, I grow mandan corn from North yeah. Dakota. I swear it's like 70, 80 days, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, perfect crop. And uh, the GMO and all those guys this year, worst drought in the history of Minnesota since um, the Dust Bowl. And you know what? Their crops failed. I was like, go heritage varieties. Go team, they're smart seeds. Mm -hmm. You know, these other guys aren't smart seeds. These guys are are uh um you know they're they got a they got a robot in their brain they don't have a brain you know well kind of that's a good transition to some of the crop specific questions that we had pop up uh uh, what one of our uh, viewers asked, what's the name of the variety of potato that's red and has clumps almost like a cluster of grapes i don't know you have to look that one up i don't grow that is that interesting all those potatoes though they look like, incredible yeah we might yeah, have to I'm do like, a little and why do, why do you look like that, Mr. Potato? I mean, who knew why they, you know, all those things. But, you know, I grew, I mean, I've been like exploring my potatoes. I think that sounds funny, but purples, that's my gig mostly. But I get these fingerlings, these, you know, French fingerlings or Russian fingerlings, very good. I grow Northern varieties that are like, seem to be, you know, pretty tough in, in the time. So, you know, grow, grow stuff that makes sense and be a little courageous and, and love your garden. I mean, you know, that's how we're going to, I mean, the thing is, is that plants are what we need. We don't need more people. We need more plants. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, and uh, uh, Becky wanted us to ask, uh, we had a question around that that said, are there any other crops you're growing besides the squash, uh, potatoes, and hemp? And uh, if so, are the seeds available? Yeah, I mean, I grow corn, beans, and squash, potatoes, tobacco, and hemp. And then I grow like a bunch of cool tomatoes and garden varieties and basil in large abundance. And uh, in that, um, yeah, I mean, we have some seeds available and I think that, um, but you look for like seed savers exchange and those guys look for your region. But my mandan varieties of corn, I think I originally got it from like Johnny's and yeah. um, you know, so I go to Johnny's for a lot of my stuff. I think a lot of our seeds are 
like that. But I, and the beans I grow, I grow Hidatsa and Arikara beans, Northern Plains, because the um, Missouri River is kind of like, is like the Nile River of, uh, it's like the Nile River Valley, you know, it's the, the Fertile Crescent, so. Wow, fantastic. One, one of our archeologists popped in to ask uh, uh, Dr. Susan Ryan, um, who's very interested in this right now, she wanted to know uh, if you're noticing any changes in the wild rice crops as global warming gets worse. Well, this year, because of the drought, some places like Big Rice Lake, you couldn't even get on. Couldn't even get on. I saw a guy go out there with like snowshoes to go harvest mm -hmm. wild rice, you know? Um, and some other places, the rice was good. You know, torrential rains will uh, drown out of rice, but because we have so many different lakes, you know, some of the lakes did okay. Most of them, you know, you had to look for where the lakes were higher and then they were lower this year and then the rice came back. And that's the thing about this too, is that like for us, you know, wild rice is so resilient. So there's one, one lake called Onamia Lake and that lake had uh, wild rice, but for 50 years it didn't have rice because the white people in their fancy boats to um, raise the water levels on the lake. And so the tribe tried to, the Mille Lacs band tried to get it reduced for many years and the state wouldn't do it, you know, for the Indian people. And then they had a drought and all the, and 50 years later, the rice came back. Did you hear what I said? 50 years, that rice stayed in the ground, at the bottom of the lake, and then it came back. So I was like, vote for the seeds, believe in the wow. seeds, you know? I love that. Actually, I, I first see someone making a t-shirt that says believe in the seeds uh, from our organization. Yeah, I just now. thought about that. That does sound pretty good. Too. Yeah. I don't believe in a lot of stuff, but I believe in the seeds. They're so like, I love that. <laughs> well, you know, have you ever seen that saying, which is they they buried us. They forgot that we were seeds, right? Right. Believe right. in the seeds. Mm -hmm. uh, love it. We have a, a question from a first year uh, doctoral student uh, who's doing this kind of research and is looking for a little gu a potential guidance from you that says uh, that she's a first year doctoral student studying uh, environment and resources and is interested in pre-ecological agricultural systems and economic diversification for tribal nations. Uh, we would like to know what would you say are the biggest research questions that would push the movement forward? I want my work to be salient. Well, it's such an interesting topic. I mean, how do, you know, what do you need to rebuild a food system? That's really the question. You know, and, 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 you know, I think that these questions that I ask are where it's the energy going to come from, like how much of it is human powered and how much of it is horse powered and how much can you avoid, you know, fossil fuels in your system. And, and um, how do we, you know, rebuild those because the thing is, is that is that it's not just the seeds, it's this, it's the, it's the, the, the cuisine and the ceremonies that go with them. And so, you know, it's such an integrated you know, an integrated amount of, uh, of, of beautiful, you know, beautiful opportunity to, to rebuild a food system or regrow it, you know, but I think it's, it's really great that she's working on that. And it's, there's, there's case studies or there's examples in so many places too. Thank you. Um, Becky, did you want to jump in and, and ask this question that you, you made note of? Sure. Um, yeah, it's uh, one question is, can you talk about AAI a bit from Cowboy? Yeah. yeah. Anishinaabe agriculture. That is our, um, that is, um, you know, so I'm interested as you get gathered in farming, you know, and I farm most of my adult life, but I farmed on other people's land and, and um, you know, I had organizations. And so about four years ago, I bought that farm that you saw the boys at I at, you know, that's the hemp farm. And I was like, I'm gonna quit. Cause, cause, cause crops like plants need farmers. They need people. They don't need tribal governments. They don't need departments. They don't need grants. They need people. <laughs> that's what I would say. So you know, we rebuilt this commitment to the plants and started growing. And then we now have two, two farms and, and, um, and, and we, we have, well, we have a, a Anishinaabe agriculture farm and then we started growing on more, more land. And so we're interested in these questions of restoring of food systems and what plants are good, restoring seeds for our region. You know, we aren't anywhere near we could, where we could be in our test crops because we're underpeopled and our people are, are uh, just learning. And then second, we're interested in like how to do things with, with traditional fertilizers 
So we got a lot of horse manure and people say you can't grow things with horse manure and to that I say horse shit. I will tell you that I have all kind of giant cool vegetables that grow with horse manure. And I'm just like laugh when people say you cannot. They, the squash loves it. My Lakota squash, just like 38. No, there was, excuse me, there were 70 of them. Just like, we are loving this, we are squash. So, you know, relearning how to build soil because soil is what life is in. And that's not just my challenge, that's everybody's challenge. But um, then, you know, so our work is in, is in that. And then more, our work has become kind of a farm education project. Like people are, don't know how to garden. So show them how to garden, you know, have them come out to the farm, see what traditional varieties we grow, kind of get like a, a, you know, get, get into the spirit of it. And, and, and then the other thing that we have done is really uh, um, focused on hemp because nobody's focusing on hemp and, you know, it's still like, you know, I, I have some Navajo uh, weavers that have come to visit us and uh, they, they were using, they're using our hemp in their weavings. But as you know, it's illegal in Navajo. And so the question then becomes like, if hemp is this great crop and you really think that maybe bioremediation might be possible with hemp at Navajo with all those, you know, abandoned mines down there, right? Like what if you could clean stuff up with hemp? Um, someone's need to grow it. So we're working on varietals and um, super interesting, you know, seeing how they grow. And, and uh, I got some feral hemp from the University of Minnesota. They grew a crop of feral hemp, also known as ditch weed. Did you ever hear about that before? Ditch weed? I mean, I was like, oh yeah, some old ditch weed, whatever. So apparently some of these plants hung out since prohibition in 1940 in Minnesota. So that's a tough plant, right? Wow. And they kept growing this little ditch weeds hanging out. And so the U grew some of that for us and grew some of it on my land. And I'm looking and to see the, I'm looking to see the tallest, coolest variety because that's the one I want the seeds to. And then I'm gonna add that in and we're gonna get some, we're gonna get some indigenous hemp growing up here that's hardy as hell. Wow. That makes sense. So I'm interested in all that stuff. Oh, awesome. That's actually a great transition to one of the other questions about um, someone's asked if you could talk about the capacity of hemp to grow in various climate regimes around the world and the potential for hemp to really compete with cotton and oil based synthetics for fabric. It has to. I mean, it can grow in a lot of places. You know, I don't really know, although these Navajos are up and they say it grows down there. I don't really know. I'm a Northern Plains, Great Lakes farmer. So I'm just trying to figure out how to make it grow here. And it, you know, it's not, you can't say it grows like a weed, but it does need some love and attention. And I don't grow, I mean, I do grow the CBD varieties too. I grow a Delta variety, very nice. And those, the girls, the girls are totally uh, divas and they should be grown and treated like divas. If you want your plants to be happy, don't grow a massive crop. But I think that there's broad application of hemp to replace and eclipse cotton. And, um, but I, you know, I'm interested in hemp primarily, but I'm also interested in linen because uh, linen comes from flax and North Dakota is burning acres and acres of flax every year. Um, but instead we could be turning into linen and hemp and then we'd have a North American, uh, we would have a really great North American fabric and textile industry. That's like my dream. But you know, I have to say my grandmother was a textile worker. I was talking to someone about this. And so I decided that it must be because my grandmother's a textile worker that I become preoccupied with fiber hemp. But, you know, not a bad thing to spend your next 20 on. New Green no. Revolution. That sounds like a, a, a memoir chapter uh, for sure. <laughs> oh, I see that somebody got that Getio Kosaman. I don't know why they call it Kentucky squash. I'm going to have to get rid of that. Where did the Kentucky squash come from? They don't get to call it Kentucky squash. I'm just looking at the chat. Baker Seed Catalog. <laughs> Kentucky was never in the discussion. Well, I'm excited to talk to some of our some of our Navajo partners uh, and friends about about the hemp uh, possibility down there too. Um, well, they have to decriminalize it. Go ahead. Yeah, they, our our tribe is actually uh, was interested in in farming because we have a farm and ranch enterprise and we have X amount of water that we get that we can um, farm and we do a lot of feed corn and stuff. So, so the tribe was kind of interested in that as well. 
No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, I think it's good if, it, but the, the, the challenge is, is that because it was criminalized, there's really no knowledge about how to process it. And so people get in and they're like, I'm going to make a million bucks. And I was like, no, you're not. You're going to have to watch the plant. You're going to have to figure it out with the rest of us. So I've been looking, I've been wandering around for a number of years, seven years with the hemp license, right? And I get to go all kinds of people because I'm me and I get to go all kinds of places because I'm me or listen to all kinds of people. And so I looked at all these things and I was like, so what's it do? And, and nobody is processing textile quality hemp material in, in the United States. I don't think anybody is in Canada. They're only processing it in Europe. And so the, the technology that is in other countries is not here. And our tribes need to be at the front of the next economy because hemp represents a brand new economy. It's not like we're fighting for a different economy, piece of a pie. It's like an entirely new pie. And we need to be the people processing it. We need to be the people that, you know, capture the value added and have the seeds and, and you know, tribes like yours have like, and mine and to the West of me, they got some acreage. You know, we want to grow food first, but then we want to grow hemp too, you know, cause grow your food. But this is the revolution is in this, but the questions of like, I'm going to meet with some guys on Monday about turning it into um, spinning it basically with wool to turn it into uh, insulation, you know, because wouldn't it great, be great to get rid of fiberglass insulation, uh, uh, right? That's what I want to do. So you can make, you know, healthy houses. And so these guys are so excited to meet with this. And so I'm just trying to figure out like how many acres of hemp I'm growing next year and how the heck we're going to do this. But I'm very excited. You know, it's much more fun to create the next economy than it is to like, I mean, I don't, I don't really like fighting oil companies, but those guys, they hang on to the end, don't they? But you know what? They, the world is changing. We all know that because we're sitting here on Zoom, right? We know that because everyone's divesting from the tar sands. And we know that because Exxon isn't even in the top of the S&P anymore. Who's at the top of the S&P? Well, that's those disruptive technology guys, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, right? They're the new billionaires. It's not the oil companies. So let's be the disrupting technologies that change the world. That's, that's what I think it's time to do. I love it. And that's probably a good, we're a little past five and we want to be uh, respectful of your time. And uh, so um, I'm, I think we're, we're all incredibly inspired. Thank you so much uh, for, for joining our little webinar series. Uh, we're so grateful and we might be pestering you a little bit more as we uh, come up with some project ideas uh, coming out of this and some catchphrases. So we, we will not uh, not forget believe in seeds. And uh, I think soil is life is another one that jumped out at me. So thank you so much for, for joining us. We're so thank grateful. You. So I, I was honored and, and my best wishes to all of you down there and uh, eat some green chili for me because I could use some. <laughs> We will. We'll, we'll pester you to come out here and we'll make, make you some really amazing. I know. I'm chili. like, where's the green chili? Remember I used to fly and I got to eat green chili. <laughs> Maybe I'll drive. More. <laughs> there you go. Then All you can right. take some back with you. All right. I think I might Thank just you so much. Nikwich. Nikwich, you guys have a good day. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Bye-bye.